What's up guys, it's Dollmatter here, and today we're gonna to be reacting to another Kings and Generals video. So this is another little one-off one uh, about Chinese history. So this is the An Lushan Rebellion, one of the bloodiest conflicts in history. I don't think I've ever heard of this one. Um, apparently it killed 40 million people. Man, it always blows my mind how many people die in these wars in China. I, I guess it makes sense when you have such a massive population. But yeah, anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. I don't think I'm familiar with this. The middle of the 8th century was a period of profound turmoil across Eurasia, from the Carolingian unrest in 751 to the Abbasid Revolution of 746 and the Tibetan Rebellion of 755. However, the most devastating of these upheavals was undoubtedly the Anlushan Rebellion in Tang, China. This cataclysmic but lesser-known conflict ended the High Tang Golden Age and resulted in the deaths of tens of millions of people. Welcome to our video on the An Lushan Rebellion. Man, the fact they had that much population this long ago, imagine how large their population would have been had they never had this. Right, like, and they've had so many of these. That's what's always so crazy to me. Like, if you look at like the list of Wikipedia of the most deadliest, the, the deadliest wars in history, right? You have World War II, and then here, let me uh, deadliest conflicts in human history. Let's check the w Wikipedia page for this list of wars by death toll. If it wants to load, apparently Wikipedia is not loading right. There we go. Uh, so yeah. Oh wow, this is the second most ever. Wait, what is... Wow. I didn't realize World War One was so far down. I thought World War One was the, sec uh, the third. I knew the Taiping Rebellion w had more. But again, look at this. Right? World War Two, deadliest war in history. Then the An An Lushan Rebellion, just in China. Now, this is just in China. Three Kingdoms War, just in China. Taiping Rebellion, just in China. Manchu Conquest of China, just in China. Right? And it's so many, like, oh my god. Well, then World War One, obviously, global. Russian Civil War. I didn't realize the Russian Civil War was that brutal, actually. Thirty Years War. Uh, Dungan Revolt, just in China. Chinese Civil War, just in China. Uh, the Reconquista. I'm surprised the Reconquista is up there, too. Uh, Napoleonic Wars, Second Congo War. The Napoleonic Wars is kind of multiple. I mean, so is the Reconquista, though. But yeah, just uh, like just the amount of just random civil wars that are like, you know, deadliest wars of all time. It's just insane. Yeah. But before we jump to the video, allow us to say thanks to the sponsor of this video, World of Warships Blitz. This free-to-play game, available on Google Play and the App Store, allows you to conquer the seas, commanding some of the most iconic warships in exciting tactical combat. And there are always new ships being added to the roster. So enter the intense PvP battles and experience fantastic 3D graphics. Install World of Warships Blitz now using our link in the description below, reach level 3, and get a free ship, a Tier 3 battleship, USS South Carolina. Installing the game from our link is the only way to get this bonus. After a period of disunity lasting over two centuries, China finally began its reunification in 581 when the Sui dynasty overthrew the Northern Zhou. By 587, Sui had easily crushed and subjugated the smaller Western Liang. After What's interesting is how many of the winning side, the winning side of the Civil War always seems to start in the south at least the ones that i'm familiar with maybe there's some or sorry always starts to start seems to start in the north maybe there's somewhere that didn't happen that i'm not familiar with again china's had a ton of civil wars uh, but it almost always seems to be in the north afterward they struck south invading the southern chen dynasty by 589 china had been reunified for the first time in centuries since the fall of the han Though the dynasty's reign was short, a number of key aspects of future Chinese civilization were instituted during it, including the Grand Canal, rebuilding the Great Wall, and the construction of more public works. However, the strain of unification and these momentous achievements also caused discontent to grow. 
The final straw was a series of costly and unsuccessful military expeditions into Korea, which finally broke Sui power. Despite this, it has been said that the Sui laid the foundation for the greatness of their eventual Tang successors. Rebellion finally broke out against the Sui in 613, and one of their most experienced generals, Li Yuan, was dispatched to modern Shanxi with an army in order to defend the capital. In 615 and 616, he moved north and destroyed some local bandit groups, as well as repelling a Turkic incursion. Despite his efforts, rebellion soon spread across the country. And as reports of the mounting anarchy reached Taiwan, Li Yuan's advisors encouraged him to seize power. In 617, he marched south and successfully besieged the capital at Chang'an, installing a puppet emperor for a few months, but then elevating himself to the position after popular acclaim, finally establishing the Tang dynasty in 618. Oh, interesting. Over the next century, so China really attained its highest dynasty. territorial, political and cultural position yet, and many scholars consider this period of the Hai Tang to be a golden age, during which China was probably the most powerful and wealthy state in the world. The Eastern Turkic Khaganate was subjugated in 630, followed by its Western counterpart in 642. With these victories, the Tang gained unquestioned... Honestly, that's kind of impressive, because you <clears throat> you really don't see a lot of sedentary populations moving into steppe land and successfully conquering them until we get to the Gunpowder Age, right? Before that, this is probably the only example I can think of where that happens before that. Other than, like, very small examples, like, you know, the Greeks had some territory in the steppe, the Romans had some territory in the steppe, but it's like very small amounts. It's not like taking over an entire steppe empire. ...hegemony over Central Asia and the prosperous Silk Road caravan cities in the Tarim Basin. It also successfully expanded into Vietnam and Korea, rising above the failures of previous dynasties. In the bustling cities of China, writers such as Li Bai and Du Fu created some of the most revered poetry in the ancient Chinese lyrical tradition while beautiful paintings and expertly crafted pottery were created and even exported throughout the world. To do this, a quasi-modern export industry was developed, where Tang craftsmen would produce goods for specific markets, such as bowls inscribed with Islamic symbology for sale in the Muslim Caliphate to the West. Oh, that's interesting. In the bustling markets and streets of the imperial capital of Chang'an and other large Tang cities, Indians, Persians, Arabs, Koreans, Syrians, Sogdians, and others functioned as merchants and worshipped in their own manner, tolerated and encouraged by the high Tang aristocracy and monarchy. It truly was an age of gold, but it was not to last. As Emperor Xuanzong came to the throne in 712, the Tang Golden Age reached its apex. The early part of his reign was the period of greatest creativity of the dynasty, and many of the greatest aforementioned works of the period were created in it. This all changed in 736, when Li Lin Fu was appointed the chief minister. At the same time, Xuanzang was influenced by religion and his favorite courtesan, and became less interested in ruling. In 742, Li Linfu conducted a series of purges, getting rid of the most talented potential adversaries at court. By 747, he was the de facto dictator. Arguably the most damaging of Li Linfu's policies was that of exclusively employing non-Chinese generals as military governors. By entrusting armies to men with no political ties to the court, he hoped to prevent rivals from rising to power. However, yeah, that, that's not going to work, right? These guys are still obviously power hungry. You see, the Romans made the same mistake, right? Obviously, you know, during the late Roman em uh, Empire era, a lot of these German guys become, you know, in, char in charge of like different high-ranking positions in the military in one way or another. And then that completely backfires, and then you get all the, the Western Empire falling apart and all these Germanic kingdoms rising up. But this also meant that the army commanders were less loyal to the central government. 
One of them was An Lushan, a general of Sogdian and Goturk origin. As one of the most powerful frontier commanders, he commanded a 164,000 strong army in the northeast and had his headquarters near modern day Beijing. He was responsible for controlling the nomadic Kitan people and other nomadic tribes in the Manchurian region. In addition, Xuanzang and Li Linfu gave him unprecedented favor, appointing him to high-ranking offices, giving him the rank of prince and the right to mint coins. Meanwhile, Emperor Xuanzang's favorite mistress influenced him to appoint several of her kin to important government positions. Oh God. As the late 740s progressed, one of these family members She must have sucked the soul out of that thing. <laughs> Yang Guozhong began to make alliances with the enemies of Li Lin Fu, challenging his power. He also began conspiring to remove his courtly rival's ally, An Lushan, from his command. The situation became even more dangerous in 752 as Li Lin Fu passed away. Yang Guozhong took control of the imperial court and sought to eliminate An Lushan. Man, the... so, so we're gonna have one of the deadliest wars in history started because a guy was too busy simping for his fucking concubine to actually pay attention to what's going on in his country. Simpin gets people killed. Reasoning for what occurred next is debated. It could be that An Lushan felt threatened in his position by the fickle court in Chang'an, or that he simply desired to usurp the Tang dynasty, or even that he began to fear that he was losing the emperor's favor. Whatever the case may be, after continuous escalations between An Lushan and his enemies, he set off from Fanyang in early 755 with around 150,000 soldiers marching south in the direction of Luoyang, the eastern Tang capital. At this point in the dynasty, the majority of experienced forces were on guard at the various frontiers, so there were no adequate forces to initially oppose the rebels. Although the emperor began to recall his loyal generals and armies from the western regions, it would take time to gather enough forces. A long-term consequence of this withdrawal would be the loss of Shi Yu, the western regions, for almost a millennia. One of the generals who had returned with haste from the Tarim Basin, Feng Changqing, quickly assembled a 60,000 strong levy force and moved to confront An Lushan. In a series of encounters in the eastern capital's outlying regions, the untested and raw forces of Feng proved no match for the battle-hardened rebel army and was defeated, with the beaten commander withdrawing west to the impenetrable Tong Mountain Pass with what remained. I'm gonna guess a there's a lot of civilian killing going on during this because we're, we're talking about armies that really aren't that big. I mean, they're, they're obviously big for the time period, especially considering that this is a civil conflict. This isn't a nation versus nation conflict, right? And you have hundreds of thousands of soldiers, but the, the death toll for this, I'm pretty sure it was like in the tens of millions, right? ...of his army. Feng Changqing was then joined here by another experienced general, Gao Shangji, who had recently returned from Central Asia after being defeated at the Battle of Talus. A few months later, Luo Yang surrendered to An Lushan. He entered the city and treated the surrendered Tang officials there with respect and dignity, an act which caused many of them to come over to him. At the dawn of the year 756, An Lushan declared himself emperor of a new Yan dynasty, with Luoyang as its capital. As the main rebel army prepared to march on the Tong Pass, where the loyalists had entrenched themselves, An Lushan dispatched other prongs of his army to the northwest and northeast. His northwestern advance thrust towards the bend of the Yellow River in order to secure strategic territories in the region. His eastern deployment was far more critical. As his army had initially dashed south to capture Luoyang, he had not secured the marching path with garrisons or pledges of loyalty. Due to this, pockets of Tang loyalist resistance began to spring up on the path from Fanyang to Luoyang, cutting An Lushan's connection to his home base in the north and consequently delaying his attack on the Tong Pass. 
By the summer of 756, An Lushan had regained control of his home territory and turned in Chang'an's direction once again. Concurrently, Emperor Xuanzang made two catastrophic tactical errors. Furious at Feng Changqing and Gao Xuanji for their inability to defeat the rebels, he had them executed and replaced oh, no. by a sycophantic subordinate. He then all Bro, this guy's just making so many mistakes. Like, every possible mistake. Oh my god. Let's get rid of these really smart guys because they're not able to beat, the, like, one of the best guys. Ugh. Ordered this new commander to abandon their strong defensive position and so attack An Lushan's force immediately. The attempted frontal assault turned into a disaster when the army was led into an ambush and destroyed on July 9th after marching through a narrow pass. The way to Chang'an and the imperial capital was open, and there was now nothing to defend it. It seemed as though the new Yan dynasty had won. The few survivors of the massacre in the mountain pass fled to the west and reported what had happened to the emperor. Alarmed at the news, Xuanzang and his heir Suzong fled the grandeur of the imperial capital. Two weeks later, as they reached a relay station, the royal entourage was turned on by their soldier escort, and Xuanzang was forced to execute many of his bureaucrats, who the soldiers blamed, probably correctly, for the disaster at Tong Pass. <laughs> After placating his warriors, Xuanzang fled south, and eventually reached the city of modern Chengdu in Sichuan province, while his heir advanced north and approached Lingzhou in the autumn of 756. Three days after his arrival, Suzong was persuaded to usurp the throne from his exiled father, who was granted the title Shang Huang, or Retired Emperor. The Tang's longest and most glorious reign was at an end. Meanwhile, Wait, so does his father accept this, or is it now just another faction where they're fighting as well? I'm assuming his father accept this, accepted this if he got the title. While An Lushan's main rebel army entered and occupied the capital at Chang'an, reportedly massively depopulating the city in the process. It is not known if he massacred a great portion of the city's population, or if the disruption simply caused many to flee but the formerly glorious city was greatly diminished by this part of the war. From his new base in the northwest, Suzong began to gather forces to him. In 757, he decided to borrow troops from both the Abbasid Caliphate in the west and the newly ascendant Uyghur Khaganate in the north, who likely prospered. Man, the fact that the Abbasids are in this is really interesting to me. I'm surprised that they're like sending troops all the way over to China from Chinese trade. Again, like, I guess it kind of makes sense when you think about it, right? But, like, we think of this as, like, so far away, right? Like, at this time period, China's so far away from us, right? The West, especially, like, I'm of mostly Anglo and Dutch ancestry, right? So for me, China, you know, my ancestors at this point, right, they're they're hanging out in the North Sea somewhere, right? Um, the, the This is, like, as far away as you can possibly get as far as we knew at the time. But yeah, and like you know, the the di the distant people we fought were in the Middle East. But for them, like this is right next door, I guess. It's, yeah. And did not want it to be damaged, or were promised privileges after the rebellion had been quelled. At the same time, perhaps frustrated by the inability of An Lushan to successfully advance either west to the Tarim Basin or south to the Yangtze in the face of increasingly stubborn resistance. A group of his immediate followers assassinated him and installed his son, An Qingshu, in his place. Oh, shit. However, this coup led to the weakening and implosion of the burgeoning Yan dynasty, enabling the Tang to strike back. With the assistance of newly gathered frontier forces and their new allies, the newly enthroned Emperor Su Song marched south once again and regained the twin capitals of Chang'an and Luoyang from the rebels. The existential threat to the Tang dynasty was over, but the victory had been won at great consequence. The effect of the rebellion on China had been utterly devastating, it is not known how many Tang subjects perished as a result, 
but the death toll is widely estimated to range from 15 million to 40 million. As the loyalists had been forced to withdraw both their generals and armies from the frontiers to fight the rebels, their border defences also collapsed, with armies from Vietnam and the surrounding region attacking the undefended Canton region, maintaining control over it for half a decade. In 763, the Tang's long-standing Tibetan rivals took advantage of their weakness and briefly occupied Chang'an before they were forced to retreat. I'm surprised Tibet was even able to hold it for that long. I mean, yeah, they're rough mountain people. They're probably going to be a lot tougher than, you know, the lowland sedentary population. Again, if you, look, you go back to this time, right, there's certain geographies where there's just tougher people, right? The steppe, the mountains... Um, you know, stuff like this. They just produce tougher warriors. So that part I'm not surprised about, but just the population difference. Even today, today, Tibet's like very sparsely populated. The Tarim Basin and Northwest was permanently lost, along with its rich horse-rearing pastures and wealthy oasis cities. During the rebellion, An Lushan had also seized the Grand Canal, cutting off the flow of grain, cloth and money to Chang'an. Furthermore, after he had seized the capitals, the imperial government lost all of the granary contents and the wealth in its treasuries. As a result, the previously prosperous realm was now in dire need of funds and began selling titles and positions, which had before been occupied by skilled and examined bureaucrats. This situation was not helped by the fact that the old taxation and land system completely collapsed in the rebellion, as many tax rolls were destroyed or became obsolete due to the massive casualties and amounts of civilian displacement. The last embers of Yan Rebellion were not extinguished for another decade, and the impacts of this conflict would plague the Tang Dynasty for the rest of their reign. They would rule for another 150 years before the unified China once again fragmented, but would never again reach the heights they had achieved before the rebellion of An Lushan. We have many interesting stories to tell, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. It's amazing how one bad emperor just simping over his concubine can just end a dynasty, or not, I guess technically not end it, but almost end it, and weaken it to the point where it's never able to recover, right? The fact that they, you know, they go from the high point of China up till that point, right? Like, they have, I believe at this point, the most territory China's ever had, largest population China's ever had, richest China's ever been, and then one guy and his concubine just ruin it by not paying attention and just, yeah, getting sucked off in the corner. Man. Terrible. Also, it's just insane how, how m many people died in this. And yeah, the, the repercussions, it, like he was saying, the other repercussions, you know, affected the rest of the, the Tang Dynasty. But arguably, they still exist today, right? Like you had, I don't know what the population was in total, but like you had 40 million people die, right? If we assume each one, you know, obviously birth rates are way lower now, but back in the day, people used to have a lot of kids. That's how many hundreds of millions, if not billions of people that would be alive today. China's population might be double what it is today had they not, uh, had they not all died in that war. You know, the, the economic might they'd have then would just be absolutely insane. Obviously, there's, you know, then that probably, you know, counterfactuals are counterfactuals. So you never know what would have happened had they not died. You know, then the rebellion happens 10 years later, 20 years later. You know, there's a, a, a fucking major famine 100 years down the road because they can't feed the, the population, whatever. But, um, yeah, it, and that is a lot of people. The, again, the Chinese, like, the, the amount of people that die in their civil wars is just insane. Just absolutely insane. But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.